Hello and welcome to The Orchard Online. I'm glad to be with you today. My name is Ken Glazier. I'm the pastor of Orchard Christian Fellowship. We call ourselves The Orchard. And I encourage you to connect with me in this week ahead. Send me an email if you choose. Ken at orchardnh.org or go to our website, orchardnh.org, and there find information about the life of the orchard, the many, many ways that we are loving God, loving people, and living God's message. And so I encourage you to do that. Today, we continue on in our journey through Romans, a roadmap for community. So I invite you to find your Bible, open up your app, Romans chapter 3, in anticipation of our time together in God's Word. Let's watch this now again. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. The movie Groundhog Day was released in 1993. We just celebrated its 30th anniversary. Groundhog Day is a story of a weatherman sent to Pennsylvania to record whether the groundhog sees his shadow or not. The character, Bill Murray, then begins to relive that day over and over and over again. In fact, 38 days are contained in the movie Groundhog's Day. And, and our teaching today in God's Word is going to be a little Groundhog Day-ish in the sense that we go back over once again a concept that the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, wants to make sure that his listeners have firmly grasped this truth. All of mankind, all of humanity is under sin. Last week, Pastor Ryan, great teaching, gave us the understanding that the Apostle Paul looked at the people that he had been connecting with throughout the whole Mediterranean rim, people that he had shared the good news of Jesus with, told them the story of Jesus, and he watched, and he heard, and he, he perceived what was taking place in the hearts of people. He's heard their questions. He's wondered, how does this connection between our disobeying God, connect with obeying God? How do we become people who follow after God? How do we get out from under, under sin and its powerful grip upon our lives? The Apostle Paul, like Groundhog's Day, keeps coming back to this concept over and over and over again. He's determined to tell all who are listening, that there are no excuses for us living under sin, that there's no privilege for those who seem to rise above it by virtue of their good moral life. And he says that there is no religious advantage to any of us, that all of us are living under sin. So in addition to the questions he asked at the start of Romans chapter 3, now the Apostle Paul asks a question himself, beginning in verse 9. Let's listen as Paul asks this question on his own. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. No, there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. 
and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. Pray with me, please. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We need to hear these truths communicated to us by the Apostle Paul again and again, probably more than 38 times. And though it's taken me many more times than 38 times for me to get this message that the steep descent of humankind's distorted perception of God and of humanity has led us down a steep descent into a large cavern. The air is stale and thick. People are living there, but people are kind of groping about in complete darkness. The loud cries and the muffled moans give voice to our desperation. This portion of the journey is, is difficult. Yes, Romans is a roadmap for community, but we have to understand that we begin our journey through Romans as a people filled not with God's life and his love, but a people in complete darkness, under sin. Listen once again to Romans chapter 9. What then? Are we any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. That phrase, under sin, Previously, Paul has detailed the various sins of both the Jews and the Greeks, the insiders and the outsiders. He concludes, all are under sin, under the power of sin, under the dominion of sin, living in the realm of sin. I, I take that simple three-letter letter word, sin, right, S, lowercase, I, uppercase, N, lowercase, now, I in sin stands for idolatry. I will make just about anything, a pursuit, a pleasure, something that, that I have received from God in my world, and I will make it my God. Oh, I can make an idol out of it, just about anything. So the sin, capital I, it is idolatry. It's immorality. Left to my own desires, left to my own way of living life, I will choose to go contrary to the heart of God. Because that sin, capital I, puts I, puts me first. So, how is being under sin expressed? What evidence does the Apostle Paul give for how we live under sin? He takes his Bible, his scripture, and opens it up. And this portion of scripture that is here in Romans chapter 3, beginning of verse 10, is what is called a karaz, C-H-A-R-Z. In Hebrew, it means a string of pearls. It was a technique used by writers in the New Testament times. But they would take a whole string of of scriptures and they would put them back to back in order to communicate the strength of the truth found within God's heart for us. And God's heart for us is that he sees us where we are. He sees us under sin. We are under sin in our very nature, our very com composition as humans we are living under sin again scripture says it this way verse 10 as it is written there is no one righteous not even one there is no one who understands there is no one who seeks god 
all have turned away. All alike have become worthless. We are under sin in our essence. We are under sin in our environment. Five times in the original text of this portion of Scripture, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, five times Paul says, no one. In English, we say it this way. There is no one righteous. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. No one. And then he says, all, all alike have become worthless, worthless, a powerful word. It's used to describe rotten fruit. All of us have become worthless, like rotten fruit. And how is our nature of being a community under sin most clearly expressed. It's in the way that we talk with each other, the words that we say. We are under sin in our very nature or composite composition as humans, and we are under sin in our speech. Here again, Holy Scripture, verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Throat, tongues, lips, mouths, all means of speaking. And today, our capacity to communicate to the ends of the earth through our phones has increased our capacity to communicate on an exponential level. But the greater means of communication have only given the way to greater expressions of darkness, of our darkness, living under sin. Jesus said it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our words, Paul describes as an open grave, both the corruption of our spoken words and the deadly effect of our words. How many of us can remember words spoken against us? Those words have a powerful effect upon our sense of self. Those words undermine who we are as people. Those words are like an open grave. Our words, they deceive, Paul writes. We use falsehoods and flattery to get what we want because we live under sin. And then he says that our lips are filled with viper's venom. Words are destructive. Words are poisonous. Our words are, as Paul says, full of cursing and bitterness. Words of resentment and ang anger. And the universal expression of being under sin is felt and heard in our words, the way we speak one to another. Just a few touches with social media today will tell us how powerfully we have learned to communicate not well, giving each other encouragement, but we, living under sin, have found ways to tear people apart with our words. So we are under sin in our very nature. We are under sin in our words. And we are under sin in our conduct as well. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul is quoting from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 7 through 8. And he is taking out of his scripture a description that the conduct of our community of humankind is becoming more violent, more vitriolic in words which inspire even more brutal actions. The very nature of who we are as a community 
living in the steep descent, living in the deepest darkness, living under sin. Our community of being under sin is that our nature, our speech, and our conduct has led us to this place. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Christian author Thomas Schreiner writes this, Sin at its heart decenters God. It degods God. It rejects his rule over our lives. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul declares the universality of humanity being under sin. But the God we must reverence and fear is also gracious. By his grace, God illumines the darkness by the light of his law having been given to us. The law, and here I believe the Apostle Paul is referring to the Torah, his Old Testament, our, our, our Old Testament, his, his Bible, God's instructions for his people as how they are to live out his character, how they are to live out his nature. And, and the law had been given to the people, the Jews, and Paul also says to the Gentiles by virtue of the way that they live their lives. The law illumines our lives living under sin. And Jesus took his own expression of his understanding of humanity and are living under sin. And he took the law beyond outward actions and rituals to the real core issue of our inner lives. Because real transformation comes from the inside. God brings healing and change on the inside. Jesus will extend the reach of God's law from external traditions and rituals right into the human heart where we are living under sin. The law of God, far beyond the do's and don'ts, far beyond the do's and don'ts, the law of God is insufficient to bring about that internal change that must happen if we are being transformed into the very image of Jesus. The law of God, like a light, a lantern or a candle in Paul's day, illuminates the nature, the speech, and our conduct. But it is insufficient to bring about the change that must happen for a community living under sin, for us as individuals living under sin, living in the realm, in the dominion of sin. Understand this. And let this be our takeaway from today. A community under sin doesn't need a rule book. We need a way up and out from living under sin. And like Groundhog's Day, we need something, someone to be different. The path up and out from living under sin is found in the person of Jesus. And praise God for us having walked through Paul's repeated efforts to bring home to our hearts this truth that we are under sin, that we each, Jew, Gentile, Greeks, all alike are living under sin. And, and we could get to a point of desperation saying there's no way out. There's no way up out of the steep descent from where we find ourselves. But praise God for the next portion of scripture. We'll explore it next week. And the Apostle Paul begins with these two simple words. But now, oh, but now, God has made a way for us out and up from living under sin. Pray with me, please. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, oh, thank you that you bring us to a place you have for me 
you bring me to a place of the utter desperation of living under sin. And it's powerful, destructive effect I see in my life and the lives of other people. And so, Lord Jesus, thank you that you have come to lead us up and out of the dominion of sin and to follow after you. Lord Jesus, thank you. Teach us now to look to you, to see your feet before us, and to follow after you. And together, God's people said, Amen. Amen.